Uh, hey, everybody, welcome to The Debrief, uh, a series of conversations with founders, executives, and talent thought leaders about how they've built talented and diverse teams. I'm your host, Teddy Chestnut, co-founder of Bright Hire, and I am super thrilled today to be joined by Lars Schmidt, uh, founder of Amplify Talent, which connects, develops, and empowers the next generation of transformative people leaders. Lars, welcome to the show. Super happy to have you on. Yeah, Teddy, good to be here, man. I appreciate uh, you inviting me to join and uh, look forward to our chat. Awesome. Well, this is going to be a fun conversation, a bit about like your career background, how you got into this space as a foundation for your perspective, some thoughts on hiring, on DEI, on the future of AR, uh, AR of HR and AI, put those together. Uh, but first, like maybe a did couple- Did you just create more, a new but, term? I think did, I did. Are, are you breaking well, ground here already? No, maybe like the next version of uh, interviews will be like, you know, <laughs> augmented reality or something like that. Who knows? That's, you know, I'll have my avatar talk to your avatar. We'll uh, look it up. I, I, I don't think we're that far off from that, but we can talk more about that uh, maybe, maybe, maybe later in the show. All right, well, let's, we're already, already warmed up here, but let, let's actually, uh, let's kick this off. So uh, a couple of quick like, questions to get going. You led recruiting uh, and then HR for Ticketmaster Live Nation uh, for, for many years. What is the best concert or like live event that you've gone to? Um, wow. Uh, you know, I think the best... Well, if you say live event, I would have to say the uh, 2013 national championship game when my FSU uh, Seminoles won their third national championship. If you say concert, uh, it, would, it would be Stevie Wonder. Uh, the Stevie Wonder show in Maryland I saw, it was just incredible. Amazing. My co-founder, Ben, I think has seen him like four or five times and it's like his absolute top live performance of just all time. Just phenomenal, yeah. Um, Anything that you're like reading or listening to right now? You're at NPR for a couple of years. Any podcasts? Like, what's on your, yeah, what's on your reading listening list? You know, I have a, a, a rekindled obsession with Arnold Schwarzenegger right now, so I'm reading his cool. new book, uh, "Be Useful," uh, and his podcast and his newsletter. It's just amazing to see how he's reinvented himself so many times, and at each turn has reached the pinnacle of that reinvention so yeah I, I have huge admiration for him and it's just awesome to kind of see what he's doing in this chapter of his life very cool um you're the i mean the founder of your own company and you've been doing this for 10 years so maybe this is your dream job but if you weren't doing what you're doing right now like what would your other career be like you know in your second life uh or your third career like what, what would you be doing instead uh i feel like like being an inheritance person uh, living on the beach would be a cop out. So I will, uh, I mean, that's everybody's dream, right? I would take that. But, uh, you know, I, when, I, when I was a kid, I always dreamed of having, uh, being a talk show host, actually. And yeah. so I think uh, my podcast is probably the closest I'll ever get to that. But, uh, but yeah, I think that would be fun to just have a, a show where you talk to interesting people and kind of learn about their life. Did you ever get to like jump onto a show at NPR when you were there for a couple of years? Yeah, I did not. I did not. Um, it's funny. Like I, it was a missed opportunity for me. I actually didn't start podcasting until I left NPR. So I, I learned a lot more through osmosis than intentionality. Um, you know, the closest I came was we had, uh, there was another Lars, um, who worked in NPR music. Um, and occasionally we would get each other's mail. And so he was like really big on like death metal and uh and i got one of his cds and i was like hey you know it would be funny if i listened to this and did a review uh and he was like yeah that would so i did i listened to it and i wrote i wrote, did a review called uh you know hr guy reviews death metal and i pitched it uh as a series it didn't go anywhere uh, i was politely declined but uh but yeah that's maybe the closest i got uh to you know being being on a show that's amazing do, do you still have the cd I don't. I don't. I actually had, uh, I wrote it on a, a old, like my first blog on like a, a WordPress blog years ago. And I don't even know if it, it I mean, the internet doesn't forget, right? It's got to be on there somewhere. We're going so, uh, to have to. Actually, I, look, I looked for that the other day because I was like, that's probably the most fun I ever had writing a blog post. All right. We're going to dig up the link and put it out, you know, in the comments when we share this on LinkedIn. Um, all right. La last one. Uh, you've been in and around talent acquisition for a long time. What do you have a favorite interview question? Uh, you know, I always like the question, what's the best part of your job? Mm. Um, because to me, I think that answer is super illuminating of what somebody's drivers are, what they really get from the work experience. Interestingly enough, my first podcast was called 
best part of your job. And I interviewed people in different disciplines from, uh, you know, maybe the, the highlight of my podcast career was I interviewed uh, the guy who played Chunk from the Goonies. Mm-hmm. Uh, I interviewed shark marine biologists. I interviewed, uh, you know, uh, Marines who talked about their experience in combat, Hollywood producers, music producers. It was, it was fascinating because for me, I think a lot of times the role of a recruiter is somewhat voyeuristic. You get to like look into different disciplines yeah. and understand what people do who do that, even though you don't do that. And so you get this interesting kind of, um, you know, lens or vantage point, if you will, into different careers. And so I've always, um, yeah, I always like that question. And again, that led to my first podcast. Uh, that's really cool. All right, we'll come back to that in a bit. Let's give some grounding on like you, your background, your career. So uh, you've been doing Amplify for, for I think, basically a decade. Uh, mm-hmm. And the last 10, 15 years before that, the leading recruiting and talent and people. Uh, maybe like the highlights of, of that journey and like what drew you into this space? Like what got you into the people space and what's made you stay? Yeah, I mean, so I um, I grew up in South Florida. I went to school, uh, as I mentioned, at Florida State. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to be. I was, you know, marketing international business major. Um, I knew that I wanted to move to California. At that time, I thought I might pursue acting. Um, and so all I really knew is that I wanted to get to L.A. And uh, interestingly enough, we had a career fair on campus. And there was one company that had an office in L.A. And they happened to be a technical recruiting firm called Pencom Systems. And so... I interviewed with them. I said, I have no idea what recruiting is, but this might get me to LA. And so I really liked the team, liked the work. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how I, I got my start. They flew me to New York. They kind of hired people in classes where they would do a six month training program at their headquarters in downtown Manhattan. Uh, and then people would go out to whatever office they were based in. So um, yeah, that's kind of how I got my start. Um, you know, that was during dot com 1.0 days. Great time to be an agency recruiter. Then the bubble burst. Terrible time to be an agency recruiter, but luckily I got recruited at that point over to a client of mine um, who just got a big round of funding from Kleiner Perkins to revamp their business model. And so that was my first time. I was also getting kind of disillusioned with agency recruiting at the time. So I had a chance to go in-house and help them build out uh, that company. And I did that for six months uh, and then went over to Ticketmaster where I spent you know seven years, I think in eight different jobs. Um, uh, and that was you know kind of to your second question, you know where I had the most fun. I mean, that was the most fun job I had. Like that was just the environment, the people. It was my first time moving into a leadership role. It was my first time moving into a global role. There was just a lot of first. It was like a very formative role for me uh, mm. in my career. So yeah, looking back, I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'm still in touch with a lot of people who I worked with and who worked, you know, for me there. They're still good friends. So I guess that's the the mark of a uh, impactful role when you still maintain those relationships. Yeah. And what, what, like, what made you stick around in the people space, right? What, recruiting and people like, you know, a lot of people fall into it. Some yeah. then fall out, like you now have made a career out of it. What's kind of kept you in the space? Yeah. I mean, like I, I just liked for me, um, you know, I liked recruiting when I moved into a leadership role. I, I love that. I love being able to lead teams. I love being able to set like a vision. I love being able to really uh, get into the business more and kind of create a mm. cohesive plan that supports the business goals um, for the organization. So that to me was really um, exciting and fulfilling. And then I did some contracting um, with, uh, again, Magento to help them ramp up for an acquisition. And then going over to NPR is a very different environment. So I had to take, you know, I almost didn't take the job. Um, my my wife, I have to give her full credit for um, getting me there because I was, uh, you know, the commute sucked. Um, I had to go from a VP level at Ticketmaster to a director level at NPR. It was a pretty substantial pay cut. Uh, and so there are a lot of reasons not to take it. Um, but, you know, my wife being the, the rational one uh, in our partnership said, hey, you're going to learn a lot. You've always, you know, been interested in kind of media and journalism. Um, it'll be a good experience either way. And, and it was. And I think that was kind of the next chapter in my career where, you know, I went from a company like Ticketmaster where we had a pretty significant budget, team, resources, to a nonprofit with no money, no okay. team, no resources. And I was tasked with building out, I came in as their director of talent and innovation. Uh, and so I was tasked with helping them build out a whole new digital team. And so, you know, we were from a recruiting perspective, we were recruiting against for profit media companies, trying to mm. build a brand and recruit against, you know, the, the fangs of the world. Um, and so that was a really difficult job, but we went kind of, we were one of the first companies to go all in on employer brand. 
Uh, and so it was a very um, experimentative role. I had an amazing boss uh, in Jeff Perkins who really empowered me to, you know, leverage social media to get creative. And so, you know, that role was now much more of a non-traditional TA leadership role, but also a very creative role that, um, that satisfied a lot of that, um, those kind of interests of mine. And so that, that's where I ended up going deep in social media. That's where I started, you know, blogging and writing and then speaking. And that really is the springboard that propelled me into starting Amplified Talent. Um, really, and tell me about Amplify. You know, the last 10 years you've been working, consulting with teams. Uh, what, what's that work looked like? Yeah, I mean, so when I started Amplify Talent, uh, it was mostly strategic consulting. So usually in the areas of um, recruiting optimization, employer brand strategy, HR transformation, um, typically in tech, uh, usually venture back startups. So clients from um, Hootsuite, SpaceX, Duo Security, Plaid, Dashlane, et cetera. Uh, and then about, you know, four years ago, um, I evolved, I began evolving away from consulting. I launched an HR executive search practice and then two years ago launched a, uh, leadership development community, uh, and some courses and, and, uh, cohort programs aimed at kind of developing and connecting and supporting the next generation of chief people officers and heads of people. So now the business is, there's two core components. One is HR executive search, and that's on a global basis. Uh, all around kind of companies are looking for those modern, you know, uh, you know, transformation agent, people leaders. And then uh, the HR uh, leadership development community uh, as well, um, where we help kind of develop and connect and support and create an environment where people can come together, they can collaborate, they can share ideas and ultimately grow. Um, really cool. Uh, and we'll go deeper into that. It, you described uh, a couple different kind of environments where you were either on or leading talent acquisition teams, kind of like Ticketmaster, tech, well-funded, kind of large, growing fast, NPR, nonprofit, super scrappy, consulting to like, you know, early stage companies, kind of rocket ship growth really fast. Are there are there similarities? Like it doesn't matter what operating environment you're in, things that like TA teams just absolutely have to get right. And are there things that you've seen completely fundamentally different depending on the context that you're operating in? Yeah, I mean, look, whatever environment you're in, you have to deliver for the business. And, and the environment that you're in and the company that you're in is going to have a different benchmark for what that actually means, right? There's mm -hmm. going to be some organizations where they're going to lean into a metric like time to fill. There's others that are going to lean into metrics like quality of hire. There's other that mm -hmm. will lean into metrics like hiring manager satisfaction scores, uh, right? Or hiring velocity. I mean, there's lots of different metrics as you know, your audience certainly knows. And I think that uh, the, the commonality across all these different environments is they all had different metrics that mattered to them, but mm -hmm. they were all different metrics. There wasn't a universal metric that every company said, this is the thing mm -hmm. that we all necessarily want. And so, you know, that is the, the, the similarity. I think the difference is, you know, it really depends on the organization and the environment, but also their history. I, I think that's one thing that we don't always appreciate is that, um, you know, you might think, so again, I'll go back to the NPR analogy, you know, NPR was a well-established company, had a very strong consumer brand. Um, there is an expectation certainly that I had around like what their internal operations must have been like, knowing that they were such a strong consumer brand. And I got there and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, <laughs> there's a lot of work to be done. And so I think that, you know, sometimes you may, there may be, you may have a, a well-recognized brand and you may assume that they have a certain level of infrastructure in place mm -hmm. um, just based on the consumer brand. And that's not always the case. Uh, I'm coming back to that point you made around the, the, the you need to know what the metric, uh, the most important metric is, and that's going to differ company to company. How often, uh, you know, you, whether you've stepped into the role uh, or you're consulting, how often is it actually really clear that there's strong alignment between TA and the business about which metric matters? And how often are you seeing like, actually, we haven't had that conversation already and there's misalignment? Yeah, I, I think misalignment's more common than alignment. I mean, I think alignment is a hallmark of some of the best in class TA teams. Like, and I say alignment, like full alignment, not between like a, an individual recruiter and an individual right. hiring manager, like the entity, right? The, the mm. whole, like you have, whether it's SLAs or just an understanding of like, this is what we value, this is how we measure your success. I think it's more rare that that doesn't exist or that it doesn't exist at least at a, uh, a kind of across the board level 
um, for organizations. I think many of the places that I, I've worked with, um, you know, haven't had that. And it was a matter of trying mm -hmm. to establish that. This might be helpful for our listeners thinking about, you know, if, if you were to say the most important metric is time to fill, and we could talk more about why that's maybe a BS metric later, but you might say, okay, the most important metric is time to fill. What are the things that might be true about that organization, the way that you structure it, the way that you operationalize it uh, versus say, if the most important thing is you know, quality, like what have you actually seen truly differ in the, act the operations, the tactics, the metrics, the, the structure of the team, when you know, speed versus quality is the most important thing. Yeah, I mean, you could infer uh, a lot from that, right? And that's not, you know, and inferences aren't always necessarily true because every situation or organization is gonna be nuanced and have its own unique drivers. But generally speaking, if you're an organization that purely values speed and time to fill, I'm gonna think that you're more of a high volume shop. Um, mm. You're not gonna put as much time and care and effort into candidate experience into, you know, designing a thoughtful interview process into making sure you're getting the right people in the right seats. It's more about bodies in seats. And so, you know, that, that, that to me is, you know, you're probably not going to be as sophisticated uh, as a TA team. Again, I'm generalizing, of course, there, there are certainly going to be exceptions to this, but generalizing, that's kind of how I view that. Uh, whereas if you're more focused on quality of hire, building a thoughtful process, you know, that has a lot of pros, but there also are some cons. I think, you know, each of these approaches have pros and cons, and we've got to be honest about that part. There's no kind of all right or all wrong. There's right and wrong with each of these scenarios. So if you're that, um, you know, that organization is more focused on quality of hire, sometimes that lack of speed is going to cost you candidates. You're going to mm. be a little too... Um, you know, engineered in the system and the process where if you do find a great active candidate, they're going to get snatched from you because they're going to be in another, in other interview processes that prioritize uh, interview velocity. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're going to have an offer in hand. They're not going to just, you know, sit on uh, while they take the time to go through the many steps in your process. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious if you've ever found, often we put these against each other, right? You have quality versus speed or candidate experience versus speed or diversity. For, usually it's everything put against speed, right? Like I want to cover yeah. something or I want to go fast. Have you, have you found uh, specific tactics or ways to not make that a trade-off where you can actually make an investment in it and it serves both those purposes? Yeah, I mean, I think clarity up front is the most important thing. Like having a really well-designed process where all of the stakeholders are aligned, right? The hiring managers, the recruiters, the interview teams, um, the if there's a comp committee that has to review, like everybody who has a stake in that interview process, who has a role to play in that interview process, is entirely aligned on how it's gonna unfold, what the expectations are. Um, they're blocking time in their calendars where you can slot candidates in, so it's not a matter of like, oh, I'm super busy, I'll get to it in three weeks. You don't have three weeks. Um, so when you're in an active interview process, I think the, the organizations that really excel there and can balance the trade-offs of those things, are the ones that have it super well-defined uh, mm -hmm. and, and completely aligned with everybody who has a role to play in that offer process. That, that's one of those things where like, it doesn't matter what the tech landscape looks like or the candidate marketplace looks like. like that's just true. And, and, and you've said in previous interviews, like a lot hasn't changed in recruiting in the last 20, 30 years. Like that seems like a constant uh, yeah. uh, are there things that have changed in the last 10 years or even in the last, you know, year, like everybody was talking about AI and the way that AI is going to change talent acquisition, you know, maybe 10 years ago, you saw like LinkedIn really changed the way that you could build like an internal proactive sourcing organization. That was a pretty big sea change. Uh, are you seeing anything of that magnitude right now? Like, wh where are we on the AI hype cycle, basically? Yeah, I mean, we're we're kind of in like the second iteration of the AI hype cycle because you know we have to remember like AI isn't new. Uh, you know, certainly anybody who was works with uh, you know HR tech vendors know that we've been talking about AI <laughs> for years. Was it always AI? No, but I think that the main difference is the the consumer grade AI that is now available after the release of ChatGPT um, from OpenAI in November of last year. That kind of changed everything. And it yeah. accelerated both the capabilities of HR tech, the access of you and I as individuals, um, and the roadmap, I think, for every technology company mm -hmm. and certainly every technology company in, in work tech. So I think that um, the AI hype cycle and AI 1.0 was hype like that to me, I think was a lot yeah. of kind of, you know, flash. 
I think it's much more substantive now, and I think it will only increase um, as we see more of it. I mean, look at LinkedIn's roadmap for Recruiter 2024. AI and everything, right? They're revamping every product to bring in kind of generative AI, mm -hmm. you know, into it. So I think now it's not hype, it's substance. Um, and so that will fundamentally change a lot of how we work in recruiting, certainly from a sourcing perspective. Um, and frankly, from scheduling, I mean, there's so many different use cases where it's going to have a profound impact. So I think that those things are all different. Um, I think the way that we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in our recruiting efforts, and more importantly, beyond our recruiting efforts. I think that piece has changed. Hmm. Um, uh, I think the way that we think about our roles as recruiters uh, to be more of like business people than, than just pure recruiting people. And I'll expand on that because I think, you know, we, we hear the term business acumen a lot and often it's just used as a term. There's no substance around what it really means. And then in this context, you know, what I'm saying is like to be an effective recruiter, you have to know more than just the, the, the profile that you're recruiting for and mm -hmm. like what makes an elite product manager versus a good product manager or software engineer or sales rep or whatever it may be. But you also have to understand the business. You know, you have to understand the, the, how the business sits in the marketplace, how the business makes money, how the business, what, what the strategic plans are for your business for the next two to three years, you know, because part of it is you have to have that context. So, you know, not just the skills that you're recruiting for now, but the skills that you're going to need mm -hmm. in two years from now. And so with that knowledge, like we all like the Holy grail of recruiters being a trusted advisor, to our hiring managers, you mm -hmm. get that through that, that business acumen, that understanding of the business, that ability to sit down and say, hey, you know what? We're looking at candidate A and candidate B. And, you know, candidate B looks a bit more like your ideal candidate today. Candidate A, I, candidate a has some gaps, but candidate A has actually been involved in this project that we're going to be launching next year. And you don't have anyone on your team who's worked in that environment. Mm. Wouldn't it be great if you could bring in some institutional knowledge from that person who has worked in that environment, who, again, they might need a little more, you know, ramping up initially, but they're going to be able to help bring your team more up to speed when that new project hits next year. That's a very different conversation than yeah. that more transactional. Yes, candidate B does look more like your job description. You should hire candidate B, but you can't have that conversation if you don't have that awareness of the business. And so, you know, when you talk about, you know, 10X recruiters, I, I had, um, you know, Brendan Brown on my podcast last year. He's the, um, now he's a CPO of Maloco. He used to run uh, talent, he used to run TA at LinkedIn for a while. And he spent some time at Y Combinator uh, in between. and. You know, we had a conversation around, you know, we, you hear the term 10X engineers, yeah. uh, right? And we said, what, is, what does a 10X recruiter look like? Do they exist? And he had some amazing thoughts on like the ingredients of a 10X recruiter, but that, that, that hustle, that determination, but also that business awareness and understanding yeah. allows you to build that trusted relationship and be able to influence in ways that if you're just more transactionally oriented, sure, you'll get a person who will probably be fine in the role, but may not be transformative. And I think especially as we continue to have more of a conversation around skills-based hiring uh, and recruiting, we're going to need to have those influential relationships with our hiring managers who are more often defaulting towards fully baked candidates who've seen and done everything that they are going to see and do in that role that might yeah. actually not have much growth and might not be the best hire. Yeah. Um You've talked about this like level of trust as the foundation for, for effective recruiting in, in prior contexts. And certainly AI automation, giving recruiters time back should help create more time for them to get deeper in the business and build relationships. But I'm curious when you were leading TA teams, was there anything that you did in particular to either give the space or encourage or nudge your recruiters to, to invest in the activities that help them build that business acumen, that understanding of the business? Like, what, what time on their calendar was spent doing that work versus sourcing, screening, you know, following up with the candidates? Like, how did you carve off the time? How did you nudge it? How did you structure it? Because I don't think there's a single recruiter who, who doesn't aspire to that, but then we yeah. get busy. So like, how, did, how did you structure that for your teams? Yeah, I mean, I would say, uh, you know, one, I would first acknowledge, you know, the, the last time I was in a corporate role running TA teams was 10 years ago, right? So yeah. my response is going to be a little dated. But what I always encourage my recruiters to do is like, I generally had people support 
teams as best I could. There would always be some fluidity, right? Where like you have a new project that hits a particular team and you got to pull some recruiting resources from other areas. But generally speaking, I wanted those relationships to be strong. So I wanted to consistently be able to have a recruiter supporting particular teams. And I would always encourage them to like sit in on their team meetings. Um, you know, if they have like, you know, weekly update meetings or even, you know, daily huddles or whatever it might be, whatever frequency, join those understand what they're doing, understand the strategy of the department, but understand actually how the individuals within the department are supporting that strategy or perhaps struggling to support that strategy, that awareness, and also just that visibility, mm. right? I, th I think for corporate teams that are more back office and they rarely get in front of their teams, they just don't get any FaceTime, they don't, they don't know who you are. How are you gonna build that trust when yeah. you know, you're just an avatar in Slack and text, right? Like I think the more, and again, it, it obviously it's a very different world of work now with the more companies that are hybrid and remote. So, you know, that's not as easy today mm -hmm. than it was 10 years ago, but I think making sure you prioritize embedding yourself within those teams, be visible, be understood, be curious. Um, and when you do that, you build that trust. Makes a ton of sense. You, you said something that, that I thought was interesting, which is, uh, what's happening with AI actually might change the way that we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging. Uh, I, I'd love for you to, to expand on that. I'm, I'm really curious, like where you see, where do we stand today with respect to you know people leaders in DEIB? Where can we get to uh, and, and what role is technology playing in that kind of journey? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Like I think that um, I don't know necessarily that I directly connect progress in DEIB efforts in AI. Nope. Um, because I think that the progress in DEIB is more of a, a philosophical adjustment and it's more of an individual adjustment where every individual person in that recruiting team or that, uh, that people team, and it's depending on the initiative, that leadership team, um, they have to be, you know, committed as an individual to be able to, to, you know, really prioritize doing the work as an individual that allows them to have more of an impact on the organization. The only place I really see AI having an impact there is, you know, when you look at tools that, um, and this kind of also overlaps with like this transition towards skill development, um, you know, finding skills and experiences and markers in somebody's background that will indicate that they will be successful in mm. X role where, you know, a human looking at a resume and a hiring manager looking at a resume, they might not make that connection. And so I think that that, that will create, and that's not necessarily specifically towards DEIB, but it will create more opportunities for people who otherwise would not have had them because their resume didn't look a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that will have an indirect positive impact on DEIB efforts. But again, I think I, I wouldn't necessarily, yep. you know, technology is not the answer for more effective and impactful DEIB efforts. I will say that is a kind of declarative statement. Yeah, uh, a lot of folks have been tying kind of uh, skills-based hiring in general to like broadening the aperture and 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 winding the funnel, um, and and I would I'm curious your take on this. You you and you know, a couple minutes ago talked about you know candidate A and candidate B, and part of what we might look for in candidate A is not a set of skills but a set of experiences, right? Uh, she operated in this environment, you know, with these yeah. constraints and was successful here. So, like how realistically, how far can or should we be swinging the pendulum to skills-based hiring versus, I don't know, competency, experience? Like, where where actually is, the, what's the right mix of what we should be looking for when we're actually evaluating talent? Yeah, look, if I could give you that answer right now, I, <laughs> I'd, I'd be in the wrong space. Uh, I, I think in it, because it's also somewhat subjective, right? It's based on the company. There, there's so many things that have to be in place for, let's just even like narrow in on skills-based hiring. You know, it's not just the recruiters, it's not just your ability to kind of have a, a skills taxonomy that's understood and you have clear skills mapped to each job, which many companies don't. Um, it's also the ability to have hiring managers understand that you're not necessarily gonna be getting fully baked candidates. You're gonna be right. getting somebody who's maybe 70% there instead of 90% there, but they have a lot of things in their background that allow them to be, that, that's, that's a shift for hiring managers. Mm -hmm. And the most hiring managers is all the recruiters watching this right now know it's like they want someone who's done all the things that that they need that person to do and they needed them yesterday so not only are they desperate to get that person in the seat now they want that so like 
that's the barrier to overcome with skills-based hiring. It's like getting, getting hiring managers to understand that they're not necessarily going to get fully baked candidates. Um, and that, that part is a big shift and it's not just the role of recruiters to make that mm -hmm. successful, which is something that I think when we have these conversations around skills-based hiring in terms of like the right mix between company skills, experience, competency, skills and experience, you know, I don't know. I think that's going to be different for every company, but I think that, you know, you have to, I see a world when I think about, let's kind of come back to AI in the context of all of this. Like, yeah. I don't think we're that far away from having uh, applicant tracking systems or career sites that don't show jobs hmm. that ask, or, you know, that you, you can obviously get there, but rather than having like, Hey, here's like four drop down menus of cities or functions and job title search box. It's more of like a quiz. Um, hey, upload your resume or your LinkedIn profile or whatever, upload whatever other professional information you would want to share. Tell us about what you want to do. Tell us about what type of work brings out your yep. best. Tell us about what kind of work. And then having a generative AI backend to that, that can now surface up, you know, hey, based on your assessment, here are seven jobs we think you'd be great for. And of those seven, you know, four are jobs that probably traditionally you would have seen and be like, yep, that's the next step for me. Right. And like, three, oh. maybe jobs you would have never thought about. You're like, oh, really? I'm qualified for that? So again, yeah. When you think about a fundamental change in recruiting, that's radically different than anything we've ever done. You know, when I talk about like that we haven't evolved that much, like it's still, you know, human writing a resume, human writing a job description, you know, other humans making the connection between those things. That fundamentally changes everything. And I don't think we're that far off from that. Yeah. Or, or even forget about like typing it, just talk, just like, hey, I land on a cruise yeah. and like hit the button and just give the overview of who I am and what, what I like and what I've done, what I've accomplished and like, boom, here's four jobs. Uh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's pretty cool. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit. We talk a lot about hiring and recruiting, uh, which is what I live and breathe every day um, and I find fascinating. But but you've also been consulting with and developing and growing chief people officers and people leaders. Um, and anybody who's like, you know, not been under a rock for the last couple of years, like that role and the stresses on that role has been like, you know, uh, once in a generation, you know, between COVID and then the bounce back and then the pullback, like, what what are you seeing in people leaders today in terms of like how is that role changing how is it different than it looked even two or three years ago and when and when people leaders are thinking about the next two or three years what are the big themes that they're thinking about yeah i mean look i think it's uh you know in my mind there's no more difficult job in the c-suite maybe the ceo um, but I'm, I'm biased, obviously, because I'm very close to the CPO role, but I think the CPO may be more difficult because you have to know the role in the C-suite uh, requires you to understand your peers' worlds and environments and have a mastery of your own like a CPO, right? You have to understand the financials. You have to understand a go-to-market strategy. You have to understand competitive threats. You have to understand market positioning. Um, you have to build a people strategy that aligns and supports all of those as well as the direction of the business. And by the way, that has to be agile enough where if uh, you know you don't get that next round of funding or some seismic geopolitical event happens that reshapes your business, you can adjust that. Like that, that is not easy. And I think when you look at that profile, that's why you know that business acumen again, that 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 commercial experience and mindset is such a coveted uh, facet of mm -hmm. chief people officer roles today. Because you know having a, a firm grasp of HR, people operations, etc., compliance, like. That's table stakes. You have to have that, but you need a lot more than that to be successful. And I think that, you know, when you also look at, especially over the last three years, everything we've experienced, you know, like the collective we, right, from, you know, COVID, uh, social justice, you know, flashpoints and friction and tension and pushback, um, Russia's war on Ukraine, um, the current conflict in the Middle East that we're um, seeing kind of rise up again. Um, the most toxic political environment in the U.S. we've ever experienced. Um, so many of these things, like when you're a CPO, you're experiencing these as an executive, guiding your executive peers through them. You're experiencing them as somebody who the employees look to for guidance, right? So you're leading the employees through them. You're leading your team through them, and they're experiencing all these in unique ways because they're the ones who are having conversations with employees who are personally impacted by these moments or they're themselves are personally impacted. And also as an individual experiencing these things 
as a human. And so that that's a lot. And it's almost like, you know, when you look at those four levels of transaction, the way that they're engaging with those, it's like they're experiencing all of these things for X. So, you know, that's why you're seeing burnout in the field. You're seeing a lot of people, you know, stepping out of their roles. You're seeing more people moving into consulting or coaching or taking sabbaticals. Um, that's creating an opportunity for this next generation of people mm -hmm. leaders moving in. But oftentimes they're not prepared for that, which is, you know, that's a big reason why we launched the, the Amplify community and the leadership development programs we have is to help support that next generation who are now getting these opportunities. Um, but it's difficult and it's a lot. And I think, you know, we, we have to think about building resilience. Mm. You know, we've always needed resilience and grit in HR, right? Like this, <laughs> it can be a very thankless job uh, oftentimes and recruiting for that matter. Uh, but having the resiliency to be able to, you know, preserve your own well-being and kind of bounce back from these moments um, and create some separation, you know, not just physically, but emotionally from some of the events that you have to navigate, I think is, is really a key skill set today. Yeah, one of the words that you use in the description of what Amplify does uh, is uh, transformative, that would connect, develop, and empower the next generation of transformative people leaders. Talk to me more about like that word, transformation, like what, what transformation are our teams that you're working with today going through? Uh, what skills do you need in order to facilitate that transformation? Like, I'm curious about why you chose that word in particular. Yeah, so I mean, to me, you know, transformative is the ability to take a business from point A to point B. And I'm specifically using the term business, not an HR team. Mm. Um, because I think, again, when you look at these leaders, they view themselves as business people, not necessarily HR people. They're, they're helping the business achieve its goals through uh, a talent and people strategy, but they're weighing in on things beyond like, what's the right benefit suite? Like, should we do unlimited PTO, right? I mean, you're like, yes, those are things that come up in HR, but they're talking more about like, should we enter a new market? Should we open, should we create a new product line? Should we pivot the business to a less competitive spot, you know, based on where we are today? Like mm -hmm. those are, those are business decisions and that's how they view their role. And so when I say transformative, you know, a lot of organizations that haven't had those those kind of what I'd view as like top tier people teams and functions, you know, they their expectations for HR might be kind of low, right? Mm -hmm. Like make sure people get paid, make sure, you know, the the trains run on time and that kind of thing. Like, sure, we could do that, but if that's all you expect, like don't hire the kind of CPOs that, you know, that that we work with. These are people who want to actually help that business reach a new level um, hmm. and they're equipped to do so. So again, they, they view that role, they're a change agent in the position. They can get a team to rally behind a cohesive vision. Hmm. Um, they're exceptional communicators, uh, right? Who can really kind of uh, articulate, you know, uh, in pretty high level concepts in a way that employees can understand. Hmm. And, and I think most importantly, they also view their role as supporting both the business and the employees. And I think that HR, you know, there's, there's a, you know, probably stigma and in some cases very accurate stigma where HR just serves to protect the, the needs of the business. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, these transformative people leaders, they understand their role as a balance, uh, you know, really between both the employee advocating for the employee needs uh, and desires and success and growth uh, as well as the business. And mm -hmm. that's not always an easy kind of, um, you know, tightrope to walk, but, but they do see that as being what they're charged with doing. Yeah. There's, um, there's probably, there's no one path to the CPO role. Um, but, I, but it does seem that it's less common to start in recruiting and talent acquisition and move into that role versus having grown up in HR. You made the jump from, from TA over to HR for anybody who's like, had that as their grounding and experience and thinking about, well, how do I get to the next kind of phase? Like what were the lessons that you learned, the mistakes that you made, like when you made that first jump from, you know, head of talent acquisition to VP of HR? Yeah. I mean, I was always curious beyond just HR. I wanted to understand like, okay, well, like we're working so hard to bring these people into the organization. What happens then? How are we developing them? How are we training them? What do their career paths look like? Um, what are, cause that helped me be a more effective recruiter, right? If I could tell that bigger picture, that bigger story of like, Hey, not just like, here's all the reasons why you should join, but here are the reasons why you should stay. If I don't have that part of the story, I'm only half effective as a recruiter in my pitch. And so that, that piece was always something that I was curious about. 
Um, and then once I knew that I wanted to kind of move more towards that path, um, you know, I, I sat in on my peers' meetings. Um, I asked a lot of questions around like, well, how do you think about designing like an L&D strategy to build a competency in this particular area? How do you, how do you adjust when this kind of thing happens to the business? I, I was just, I asked a lot of questions and I, I, I kind of sat in that curiosity beyond just the recruiting piece because I, even before I knew that was the path I wanted to take, yeah. I felt it would make me a better recruiter. And I would say like, I wasn't always that way. Like when I when I first had started running TA, I've ever like, I, I, these words came out of my mouth one time where I was like, sitting in on a, it wasn't even a meeting. I think it was like a happy hour with one of the teams that I joined and like, uh Oh, HR is here. And I was like, Oh, you know, we're, I'm not HR. We're like, we're recruiting. We're like the green berets of HR or something ridiculous <laughs> like that, which now I cringe like, and I have to own that those words did come out of my mouth, but I was naive, right? I was, I was young. And I think that, you know, I, I, even today, like I, I see some people advocating, well, like recruiting should report to the CEO. Um, you know, we, we shouldn't be lost in HR. I'm like, well, that's bullshit because like if you don't have visibility and influence and understanding around the holistic people yeah. experience, um, how are you going to be as effective as a recruiter? So like if you're advocating for that, maybe you don't have the right CPO or <laughs> CHRO who, who really kind of creates an environment where you can do your best work, but view it as like holistic people uh, as opposed to like, well, we've got to carve TA out. I'm sure some listeners right now or viewers are saying, you know, they're calling bullshit on me. They're like, no, I do feel strongly that. that that's fine. You can feel that way. But I, I, would, I would weigh in on, I don't think that anybody who works in an environment under what I would view as like a best in class CPO, anybody running TA in that environment feels that way because mm -hmm. they know how valued their function is, how integrated it is and how important it is for everything to be connected. I think that I often hear that and I say, well, tell me about your CHRO or CPO. Oh, they're, they don't get it. They're terrible. Okay, well, okay, well, <laughs> it's an environmental thing, not a, that, that's not a kind of solution across the board. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I'm going to call you on a prediction you made uh, back at the beginning, maybe it was the end of 2022 or beginning of 2023. Uh, you said that this year was going to be about prioritizing self-development rethinking total rewards in the context of pay transparency, leaning at the DEIB, uh, cross-pollination, driving innovation, skills uh, focus, and like AI right now. We're not done with 2023, but thinking about like, okay, those seems like, what do you feel like hit the nail on the head? Was there anything that you feel like, actually this year turned out to be a very different year than what you had expected kind of coming into it? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, so that was part of, um, for the last, uh, I think, four years now, at the end of each year, I have a column in Fast Company where I cover yeah. kind of modern work practices. And so I do a, uh, um, what the next year will look like for HR post at the end of each year. And so um, I think looking back on some of my predictions um, from, you know, this year, certainly uh, nailed AI. You know, <laughs> that, that I feel, feel really good about that. It didn't really go out of the ledge there, so I can't, give, I can't pat myself too much on the back. Uh, but yeah, certainly, um, you know, the way that I framed that, I think is exactly how that played out. You know, I, I would say, you know, interestingly enough, um, personal belief versus kind of meta environment, um, you know, I felt that this is, uh, and I still feel this way, that it's ever been more important for us to lean into DEIB. I didn't expect the headwinds um, that we are certainly seeing uh, right now on some of the pushback. And some of that is political. Um, you know, certainly some of that is, you know, obviously the Supreme Court making their um, striking down affirmative action for college admissions that that does not and specifically in the ruling states that that does not impact employment. Yet there are yes. many people who are using that for cover to. Uh, yeah, yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also, even though it doesn't specifically have it yet, there are there are those who are kind of framing that to their own will to say, well, you know, this isn't really that important. We shouldn't do that. And then you have this whole political groundswell against, you know, this idea of like woke or CRT. It's just, it's become such a politicized, um, you know, topic that I think is creating some, you know, like legitimate headwinds that, that we, that are, you know, maybe blowing in the face of some of the progress we've made over the last couple of years. To me, this is the time to double down. So I still personally feel that this has never been more important, but I didn't see, I didn't foresee some of the um, the headwinds that, um, that we've, you know, we have encountered, mm. um, so far to date in 23. Uh, if there was one or two things to double down on, if you're a chief people officer or a head of talent acquisition, 
uh, where would you be investing your energy in that area today? You know, so there, there's two things, and I, and I, you know, this certainly is applicable to CPOs, but frankly, I think this is applicable to anybody who works in recruiting HR talent, uh, or probably any other discipline. Two things that are going to unlock your success, uh, or lack thereof, if you're not investing here. Um, one is learning agility, and the second is network equity. And, you know, I wrote a piece earlier this year where um, making a case for why HR needs to be more selfish. And what I meant by that, I got some pushback at the time, but I said, well, let me kind of frame what I actually mean. You know, what I mean is that whether you're a recruiter, whether you're a CPO, whether you're an HR leader, like the demands of our role are massive and there will always be things for you to do. You will, if, if you're just committed to your work, your head's going to be down and you're going to be doing nothing but work at all times. And that's a miss. If you're not proactively and intentionally setting aside time for your own personal growth and development, this kind of gets back to one of the pieces I mentioned, that fast company prediction piece, mm. you're going to be doing yourself and your business a disservice. And what I mean by that is, you know, let, let's look at like generative AI, for example. If you're not setting aside some time to experiment with ChatGPT and some of these other tools and figure out how you can use these to more effectively do your work and your role, then you are missing out on a massive productivity leverage that will actually make you more impactful. Mm -hmm. When you think about network equity, if you're not being intentional around how you build your network and build a robust network of people even outside of your core discipline, you know, the role, the value you bring to your employer is the experience and knowledge you have in your head, not necessarily the knowledge you have access to. And when you prioritize network equity, it's not just about the knowledge that you have in your head, it's the knowledge you have access to. And like, sure, we all have Google or ChatGPT. I'm not talking about being able to look up yeah. something. I'm talking about being able to like call you and say, hey, you know, I just got out of a meeting with my CEO. I was asked to do X. I've never done X, but I know you have. Like when you did X, how did that go? What worked out? What are some, you know, yep. uh, you know, risks to those that might not be obvious? Do you have any templates from when you did X? Right. You might be willing to share with me, right? It, 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 it allows when you have a, 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 a strong network equity, you have a collective intellect that you can tap into. And all of these things, while on the surface you may think, you know, this is, you know, this is taking time away from my job to work on my own development and growth. No, it's not. Because if you're actually, if you have a stronger network equity and if you have more yeah. capabilities through your learning agility, you're actually being more impactful yep. in your role and your team and your business. And so that's what I meant by we need to be more selfish. We need to think about our own growth, yes, for our future, but also for the impact we bring to our roles today. Yeah, it, it feels like it's, um, I, I see the demand for this. At, when you're ahead of a function, ahead of talent acquisition, chief people officer, there's nobody in your company who can solve the problem for you or tell you how to do the thing because you own the thing, uh, certainly yeah. for CPO, right? And so you have to look external to get validation or benchmarking or the shortcut uh, or the pattern recognition to be able to solve something. Certainly as a founder, I'm sure you feel this too. Like, you know, the number of times where I've, uh, at where a uh, 45 second conversation with somebody in my network has provided a week's worth of, of value right? Uh, yeah. Investing in that equity, that, that's an, a good mental model for it. That, what's interesting is when you said the word network equity, where my head went first was actually something that um, Rosanna Jaruthi, uh, who leads uh, DEIB for, for LinkedIn and is an advisor of ours, described as more like network diversity. Like what's the composition of your network and who's actually in it? Yeah, uh, That's where my head went yep. first, because again, when it, then when it comes to uh, attracting talent, building pipeline, right? If you start from this place of actually my network includes a whole host of different people from different, not just industries and functions, but different backgrounds, uh, you're in a much stronger place to then be able to, you know, not have time and quality or time and diversity uh, be at odds with each other because you're in the right spot. Yeah, look, and Rosanna's right. And I think that's the difference between network equity and like networking, right? Like we all know any recruiter is going to know like, oh, networking, right? You're going to go out and you know, go to that conference and meet people and shake hands and do this. Network equity is actually being much more intentional around mm -hmm. how you build your network. It's being able to think like Rosanna does and say, hey, how diverse is my network? Do I have different mm -hmm. viewpoints represented here? Do I have different, um, you know, uh, walks of life and life experiences represented that I can lean on to, mm -hmm. to help think about the things I'm working on that maybe don't match my own life experiences, but um, they're going to enrich my perspectives by understanding them like that. It's being much more intentional yep. around that. Like, for example, like I'm 
I'm a wannabe designer, right? Like I could probably go back to your question around like, what would I do if I had a career? Like I've, I love design. I've always been very, I'm probably overly obsessed with design as uh, you know, an HR person or entrepreneur should be, but, but I am. And so for me, in, when I think about my network equity, I want there to be designers in that, that mm -hmm. I can learn from and see like how they work and how they think and how they choose different colors for different things and what some of the latest trends, because I can bring that back to my work. Like, does it have anything to do with designing a people strategy? Maybe not, maybe tangentially, you know, right. In terms of like how you package it, but like to me that matters. And so I'm very deliberate in seeking that out because it's a curiosity and I think it makes me more effective in the work that I do. Really cool. Um, well, back at the beginning of this conversation, uh, you described that um, like your favorite interview question is like, what's the best part of your work? What's the best part of your job? I'll put it back to you. What's, what's the best part of your work? You know, I, I feel really fortunate to have the, the career that I do. Um, you know, I've had the chance to learn from so many amazing mentors and I still do um, that have kind of shaped my own path and my own views on the field and the world of work. Um, and I'm in a position now to help kind of pass that down and mentor others. And I mean, really kind of, you know, amplify our mission uh, as a business and certainly overlaps my own personal mission is, um, you know, building a better world of work by elevating the field of HR. Mm. And there are so many things that I have the pleasure of getting involved with and the privilege of being involved with that I think accomplish that. And so to me, that's super satisfying. It's super motivating. Um, it, it's, it's a driving force for me to want to do, to do more. Um, but yeah, I feel really fortunate to do that. And then I think again, having, a small, you know, business, um, my wife working with me. I mean, it, as a, as a parent, as a husband, as a father, as an individual, it gives me a level of freedom and flexibility to build, uh, the kind of life that I want. Um, and, and I feel really fortunate for all that. That's awesome. Uh, Lars Amplified Talent founder, CEO, uh, for listeners who want to learn more about you, your work, uh, where should they find you? Yeah, so AmplifyTalent.com is the hub for everything. So you'll find uh, the Redefining Work podcast. You'll find my Redefining HR book. Uh, you'll find my Amplify Briefing newsletter. You'll learn more about our executive search practice uh, and our leadership development community and our YouTube channel, like all the things we're involved with. That's the central hub, AmplifyTalent.com. Awesome. Lars, this was super fun. Thanks for making the time to join the debrief. Yeah, Teddy, I appreciate the invitation and uh, enjoy the chat. Awesome. Take care, man. Take care.